And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple. Some of you may know him as Confessions of a Frustrated DM, some of you may know him as the narrator, some of you may know him as the... As the as the guy who put who put out a very awesome basic edition of this upcoming project, which is now hitting Kickstarter, the one the one and only Robert. He is not a Mister Johnson, but he is Robert Johnson. <laughs> had to get I had to get at least one shot. I'm legally required to make at least one shot or run joke a week. So quota met. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing well. How are you, Mildred? Thanks for having me back to the monastery. I I am do I am doing good I'm doing good um I uh, well th well things are starting to open up at my at my particular place of work and more people are coming in there's been there's been a good news bad news situation the good news is that they're bringing food trucks on Tuesdays and I don't have to pay for it mm. the bad news is that the, is that um I'm still banned any I'm still banned from any coffee machine on on the premises. <laughs> no caffeine for Mildred. No, it's not. I can bring my I can bring my own caffeine. I can get caf I can get caffeine from the um, from from the little convenience store that's down that's downstairs from where I from where I am. But when it comes to when it comes to the co when it comes to the Mister Coffees or the Keurigs or the like, they, I'm not allowed near them because of that because of that stunt a few years back I pulled on April Fool's Day. Oh. It was revenge because somebody decided because the year before that one of my coworkers decided to leave a chocolate cake on my desk. I can't have chocolate. Uh, so uh. I, was, I was like, okay, now it's time to drop the gloves. <laughs> and I switched I switched out the I switched out all the coffee beans with decaf ones. All of the <laughs> sugar with salt. All of the cre all of the powdered creamer with flour. And all of the liquid creamer with unsweetened coconut milk. Oh man! And as soon as I was done, I I, te I texted my boss saying, "Yeah, I've ar I've already gotten my fair sh my fair share done. There's not there's nothing more coming in, so I'm gonna head home." <laughs> I wasn't I wasn't even I wasn't even ten minutes away from it when I get a when my phone starts blowing up <laughs> saying, "Pildra, what the hell did you do?" You guys just mess with the wrong monk. <laughs> <laughs> I've, have you ever heard the ancient Klingon proverb that revenge is a dish best served cold? Oh yes, absolutely. It gets, it gets very cold in Minnesota. <laughs> and after that, I the only time I'm allowed near a coffee machine is if somebody's supervising me, because they are that par they are paranoid that I'm going to try and do that again. I'm not. <laughs> if I'm going to. They they'd have to give me a reason to do it. The only reason I did it was because was because giving me cho giving me chocolate on my birthday is a declaration of war. Uh, how can somebody be so cruel, right? I I I was asked I was asked once if um if it was a if it was a case of the, of someone not knowing any better. I had already. But I'd already gone through several Halloween parties where I refu where I refused to have any of the chocolate, so there's no way people couldn't have known. Um, right, right. Plus, <laughs> um, are you familiar with Hanlon's razor at all? Uh, I am not. Never assume malice. What can be adequately explained by stupidity? <laughs> so that's uh, good. That's good. I um. Before, before we, when I was setting this thing up, um, there was a set of three questions that I shamelessly stole from John Wick. Um, at least, I, which, at least I understand, I understand game balance better than he does. <laughs> but those, but these were questions that that were meant as a bit of a thought exercise, for lack of a better term. And, though, and I figured that'd be the perfect way to open things up tonight. So awesome. Those those three que those three questions are, what is your game about? How does it go about doing that, or how being that? And what behaviors is your game designed to encourage, 
and what behaviors is it designed to discourage? So we'll start at the top. Cool. So what is my game about? Mm -hmm. Is the first question. Yes. yes. So uh, the high fantasy tabletop role playing game is about uh, heroes uh, saving their fantasy world from self-destruction. Uh, the title of the game, Peace, P-E-A-C-E, -E, comes from an ancient prophecy in the setting that says that uh, this tumultuous world will only realize peace once it has destroyed itself during the struggle between good and evil. So as a hero uh, in this world, you are charged with making sure the prophecy does not come to fruition, uh, fighting evil, uh, fighting corruption and the forces of darkness uh, to save this world that is plummeting towards its own destruction and being a wise and brave hero, knowing the difference between uh, overdoing it and uh, doing just enough to stay on the, uh, the good side of things. And um, that is, uh, that is what the game is all about. It is, um, it's not a grim, dark setting, uh, but it, it's, it's what I like to call a bright and shining high fantasy setting with a dark side. And that dark side is the prophecy that has, uh, yes, has predicted a very uh, poor outcome for, for the world. Would it be accurate to say that the, that the style of fantasy that you're going for is more, is more um, noble dark? Yes. Oh. Now I, w I will I will admit that um that once again if you're going to steal steal from the best and there's been there's been um there's been a kind of alignment chart that people have that people have put with this sort with this sort of thing where you have um you where you on one end of the spectrum you have grim dark and on the other hand you have um noble bright. And of course of course there's um there's swaps like no like noble dark or gr or grim bright, or so, or what have you. Um, <laughs> it's not, it's not quite the nine alignment setup because trying to do neutrality with this kind of thing um, is self defeating. But it's a, but it's a start. And the a big reason why I focus on the, why I'd focus on this kind of thing, as far as what, as far as what it's about and what style of fantasy you're going for, is as you've probably seen, I have been a very harsh critic on certain games that don't know whether to shit or get off the pot regarding what um what st what style of fantasy or SF or what have you they're trying to be and whether or not they have a a uh, attached setting to their rule set. Yeah, yeah, it is it is very important to decide what you're going to do uh because it is really hard to do everything well. So <laughs> Make a decision, folks. Mm -hmm. um, that's al that's also why I've uh, I have a un I have an unwritten rule that anybody who says that you could run say um, say D and D any edition I'm not playing edition wars with this for any kind of fantasy is um, e they either drank the Kool Aid or they're blowing smoke. Probably both. <laughs> um, and this um. The same, the same kind of thing. I remember hearing the exact same kind of thing on the SF end of things that you could run any sort of sci-fi setting using um, tr using old traveler rules. <laughs> nah. <laughs> well, that well that may have been that may have been the argument back in '77. As time <laughs> has gone on, traveler has been more and more inexorably linked with the setting of the Third Imperium. Um. To the to the point that, to the point that if you wanted to use another setting, you'd have to do some extensive work, which is what um. For example, that's the whole thing with Mind Jammer. Although, when I made the remark about Mind Jammer in that review, I was referring to the Fate version. I, I forgot for a second that it was that it used a version of Traveler's Rules. As far as as far as which version, I'd have to check because. That was the reason I didn't want to review Traveler. There's a fuck ton of additions over the years. Um, <laughs> but get, getting to this, getting to the second question: How does it go about being 
what you what you mentioned for the for, for the um, answer to the first question. Yes, I don't know if we talked about this the first time, but it it this uh, if we did, it'll it'll give someone listening to this episode a really full picture. So the I think the biggest way that peace does what it does, being a game about heroes saving a world from self destruction. Um, and a bright and shining setting that has darkness under the surface that you're fighting against is probably the prophecy meter. The prophecy meter is a mechanic in the game that tracks the hold that evil has on the surroundings of the heroes. Um, the meter starts at, uh, well, the meter has a range of 1 to 15, 1 being really good, 15 being really bad, and when you start a campaign the GM will have one of the players roll 2d6 and establish where the meter is. Um, and that meter has a narrative effect on the world. It has a mechanical effect. The base mechanical effect is whatever the numeric value of where the meter is, is a number of action points that the bad guys have every scene. Mm -hmm. uh, probably my favorite mechanical effect of the prophecy meter is something called darkness is temptation so at any point the game master can offer uh one of the heroes in the game or maybe multiple heroes if if he would like a um a benny and essentially what that is is darkness or evil tempting the hero and if they accept they roll on the darkness is temptation chart and the chart is weighted in the hero's favor or why would anyone ever you know accept um the benny the free benny um, but one of my favorite outcomes on the chart is the player uh, character becomes corrupted. Mm -hmm. And from that point on, the, the player character can access the bennies of the bad guys. But every time he or she does, you have to re-roll on the chart again. And other outcomes could be um, the prophecy meter worsening or the bad guys getting more bennies. Uh, and so on and so forth. So how the game captures this struggle uh, for the heroes to save this world is in a is in a, a great part. A lot of that weight is carried uh, by the prophecy meter, and mm -hmm. it's a fantastic way of if you're going if the premise of your game is going to be save this world, I think you should have the hero should have a bird's eye view of knowing so how well are we doing so it, it only makes sense and and that's how the the premise of saving this fantasy world from self-destruction is really is really brought to life uh for the player characters i believe the players now that brings me to the th to the third question what behaviors is your game encouraging and what behaviors is it discouraging uh, awesome so Outside of maybe just the premise, um, Peace is a game that, you know, if you're going to, because it's not a grimdark setting, if you're going to ask the heroes to save this world, the system had better not work against them if you are not playing grimdark. If these guys are the heroes, the system can't penalize them from jumping headfirst into trying to save this world. So... The character, the heroes are built very competently, very heroically, and the system, uh, the attack stat system of the game, uh, something cool that it does is it varies the number of attacks that characters have from turn to turn. Mm -hmm. So one turn, a character can have two attacks, one turn they could have one, one turn they could have five, but generally they are going to feel like the system is not punishing them for doing what the system is asking them to do so play heroically be motivated is one thing um that the game definitely encourages mm -hmm. and, and i guess by the same token something that the system discourages is players player characters sitting on the sideline trying to grasp what they're supposed to do you know the premise is very clear um, and something else that Peace does is during the character creation process, the last two steps is a player determining their hero's drive, 
why the hero does what he does or well we know what they're supposed to be doing they're supposed to be saving this world and not becoming corrupted while doing it us uh, but how are they going to do it are they going to do it because they believe that every life is valuable are they doing it so that their legend can be sung um throughout the land are they doing it because they just want to gain power for themselves because they think that they could do a better job at at running this crazy world or saving it if they were in charge mm -hmm. so what the game discourages is players who are twiddling their the thumbs being inactive not knowing what they're doing and not like like you said earlier um can't not not being able to decide to shit or get off the pot mm -hmm. So that, that kind of behavior of aimlessness is discouraged by how uh, characters are created, just just how they're created and what the creation process asks them to do. <clears throat> given given that, would it be would it be fair to say that um that the murder hobo archetype isn't is 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 something that's only going to be useful to a point in pieces sandbox? Absolutely, because um, something that I neglected to mention about the prophecy meter is that once you have established its starting point at the beginning of the campaign, of obviously the meter can go up and down. So at the end of each ses session, the meter is adjusted based on um, a random roll, which is uh, basically called unintended consequences of the hero's actions. And it, it's adjusted based on their good or bad deeds. So if you're a murder hobo, if you're killing things and taking their stuff, that's going to cause the meter to probably go in a direction you don't want, which means that now your adversaries have more bennies to bedevil you with. So being a murder hobo is really going to make your job as a as a as an adventurer in this world more difficult. So, yeah, it really is that that kind of murder hobo uh, philosophy. Which you know, everyone has their preferences. I'm not judging it, but in peace, particularly because of its premise, the system kind of um, punishes a little bit that that behavior. Yeah. Now, with a now, with that in with that in mind, you meant you mentioned the whole the whole thing of increasing and decreasing the prophecy meter. Um, I'm guess I'm guessing that that you have in you have in mind a mixture of hard of hard and fast rules that will not, that will modify it, as well as GM call things that would modify it. Yes, what the um, the game uh, explicitly um, tells the game master what things are considered good deeds by the heroes and what things are considered bad deeds. For instance, um, taking a life, uh, an innocent life, while not attempting to protect yourself in self-defense is considered an evil deed. Minor cruelties like stealing from innocent people is considered a, a cruel deed. Or saving lives, saving innocent lives, or doing... Uh, minor um, minor good uh, things for uh, for people are considered uh, considered good deeds and so at the at the end of a session the game master is encouraged to not discuss when they have attributed good or bad deeds to the hero so you don't get into that discussion but basically whether or not the meter goes up or down is a calculation of the good and, and bad deeds that the heroes, the, the GM has estimated that the heroes have performed in the session. And then a random role on a chart called a consequences role so that that consequences, random consequence role that also helps with the adjustment of the prophecy meter is so that players can't just game the system. Because if you, everybody knows that there's a meter that's tracking how well you're doing at reducing evil. So guys, let's never do evil. So that that consequences role, that random consequences role, which also helps adjust the meter, is there to prevent players trying to game the system. And, you know, no one said a hero's life is supposed to be easy. So that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, um, 
I'm get I get the feeling you there's pro you're probably hit plan for a um section on the GM side of things to to um help to help make it so that it's not too easy for the players to just say we're just, just we're just not going to do anything evil, but put them yeah. in situations where they might get tempted. Absolutely. Yep. And part of yeah, part of that uh that drive mechanic um, where characters determine what really motivates their characters. That's also uh, the, the game master can also look at that and um, see if to challenge the, the heroes and it, it all kind of mixes together. For instance, if you have a hero who um, believes in protecting the, uh, protecting the innocent and they walk, walk into a town and a town is run by a really oppressive regime and they see innocent people uh, being abused or enslaved. Do you, if you have other tasks that you that are that take precedence, do you stop to try to save these people because it's the right thing to do, which will help you with the prophecy meter and help you with your drive, or do you stay on the course that you're on because you have a very important task? So it all really mixes together. Um, to allow the game master to put interesting uh, questions in front of the players. Now, I don't want to leave uh, listeners with the idea uh, that peace is this this morality play where the player character's every move is is being judged. It definitely is a, a high fantasy action oriented RPG where you are going out and you're fighting fantastical creatures and sometimes you're going into dungeons and defeating traps and swinging across chandeliers so it's it's not all oh my god I'm a goody two shoes or or if not I'm going to get punished uh, but that that is that is an aspect of the game but but believe me when I came up in the hobby uh, what I love what I have always loved is going out and interacting with mechanics and being the hero. Uh, Peace is not asking the player characters to sit around a table and ponder their their existence. Though their action is going to affect the world, um, it still is a role-playing game where there's going to be uh, plenty of, uh, of throat punching. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, with, now with, that, with that kind of thing in mind... Um, I think we, I think I touched on this a little bit the last time I had you on, but we, but it was juggling between the um, the confessions show that you have and 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 just general um, general art general uh, tabletop um, design design spitballing that we that we had had back and forth last time, but mm -hmm. I don't think we I don't think we um, na we nailed down what was the, what the reasoning you had. For using a D6 based setup for the core mechanic. Ah, yes, okay. Yeah, I um, D6s are you know everybody is familiar with them. Everyone has access to them. Hey, if you're just going to strip them out of your uh, your little brother's Monopoly game, um, and I love the I love the the bell curve of the, the um, obviously of of the D6s. Um, in most cases, you will never uh, find a situation where you're going to be rolling more than 4d6 for anything. And generally, uh, the core task resolution mechanic, the attribute mechanic for the game, and the damage um, check mechanic of the game, you're actually only rolling 2d6. Mm -hmm. um, because sometimes, you know, in my mind, less is more the, the days of rolling 12 d6 in shadow run or champions at least for me um are over uh so it's really for me it's a balance of sometimes less is more so th that's even why um the core task resolution mechanic of the game the attribute mechanic doesn't use 3d6 it uses 2d6 because i love rolling dice but you know everything uh in moderation generally so I, I don't even use 3d6. I, I actually use 2d6. And plus, people are used to th ro rolling 3d6 for other games, so I wanted to be a little different. Yeah, and I could. I um. To be co to be quite honest, the only um. The only way the only way I could see myself using using a 3d6 approach with this 
is if is if I um is if I stole is if I stole a few notes from West End Games. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey, hey. If if you steal from one person it's plagiarism. If you steal from a dozen yeah. people, it's research. You're right. <laughs> let's also let's not forget that you can that um you cannot copyright mechanics. As Wizards yes. of the Coast learned the hard way. <laughs> if you're if you're familiar with the um, one stop stat block incident from a couple of years ago. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which yeah, that um probably not a good probably not a good idea to try and pet to try and piss off an IP lawyer who represents game companies. Now, just a thought. I realize <laughs> I realize that I realize that wizards and smart decisions don't exactly go hand to hand, but still, right, um, right, yeah, very true. You you probably as a gaming historian, uh, you probably recognize that the attack stat system is very similar to the um, to the attribute and skill system of uh, Star Wars D six with the the gradual pip increase to a whole D six. Um, if there's any mechanic in the game other than the attribute mechanic, which is fairly, uh, fairly common way to resolve to do task resolution, the attack stat system with warfare, power, and influence mm -hmm. um, rated by D6 and a bonus. That that's something that yeah would be very familiar with people mm -hmm. who are familiar with D6. Yeah. Now, the uh, the other the other thing that I. That I do, that I do find, in, that I will always find interesting when it comes to, when it comes to, when it comes to this, when it comes to this kind of, um, se this kind of setup, is is making sh is um, and I mentioned this beforehand, the emph the emphasis on a mechanical trinity. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Well, with that, with that being war in this case. Well, for attacking, it would be warfare, influence, and um, power. Yep. Um, when it came, um, when it came to that, when it came to that particular emphasis on a trinity, um, what would what would you what would you say were some of the influences that you were that you were drawing from or responding to? Well, I I think the biggest thing for me was um, it's almost just one of the attack stats in the game mm -hmm. uh that made me decide to go in that direction and that is influence uh so the way peace works and i i, I think we may have touched on it in the in the last episode we uh, we were together but mm -hmm. i'll just really quickly um essentially from round to round your character decides how they're going to uh, um approach a conflict either with warfare punching kicking scratching power, um, prayers, or arcane spells, or influence, taunting, befriending, or frightening a foe. And as I said, influence is the attack stat that made me want to do this kind of setup because um, I like playing face characters. Mm -hmm. And for me, it has always been a head scratcher that most games don't give you a deep mechanical uh way to use your charisma to be as effective as the other means of dealing with conflicts which has always been a head scratcher to me you know it's it's like depending on what game you're pl playing you could do combat for you know an hour 45 minutes two hours an hour and a half and the fighter really shines and generally face characters like bards or fixers in other games have to resort to being an inferior fighter or an inferior spellcaster. Mm -hmm. And it never made sense to me. It's like, so you're telling me that when things go bad, I can't frighten my enemy away. And in most games, it's a random persuasion check. The GM has to make an arbitrary decision based on very vague charisma rules. And, and it's like, okay, I guess you scare my bad guy away. But in peace, Influence and charisma is as mechanically supported, and there are op almost as many options as any other form of dealing with a conflict. So that is what made me decide to break dealing with conflicts into those three, warfare, power, or influence, because I wanted 
face characters to not have to resort to being an inferior form of an, of another character class when things went bad. Hmm. That's that, that almost the entire reason. <laughs> and that that is an interest that is an interesting point. The fact that even even nowadays, even w- one would think that that um so, that putting in social systems, in given the glut of quote unquote narrativist um games that games that have been that have been about that have been about the 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 rise of quote unquote story games that have been about that this still wouldn't be as niche of a thing. Yeah. And yet. And yet it yet it kind of is. Even even games where you'd think that there would be less excuse, like say Shadowrun, where one of the classic archetypes is the face man. Um, right. When it but when it comes to actually utilizing it, it still comes down to a skill check. A right. Pa- a pass or a pass or fail skill check. Um. I'd say I'd say one of the ex- th- I'd say that there's a couple games I can think of that are kind of the exception to this rule in different ways. Um, one of them being the crafty duology, um, spycraft and fantasy craft. I'd say that mm-hmm. manages to be an exception in the long term manner. Um, yeah. And the short term manner is Exalted Second Edition. I um yeah. I'm not I refuse to touch Third Edition for um re- for s- certain specific reasons. Um. <laughs> Well, that that and I, that and I look I looked at the I remember look I remember looking at the th- at the thing and some of the some of the decisions that they made were baffling like that whole oh Exalta is, is just Wuxia and mythology to explain why there's no Magitek which is dumb. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, but, ex- but of course Exalted had a, had a full on combat system that it treated very similarly to its nor- to its normal combat system when it came to social encounters. Yeah, and I love that, and and that's uh, it's funny that you um, mentioned Exalted because Exalted is a very very influential game uh, for me. It's it's in my uh, it's in my top five. So yeah, I've uh, I've I've um, mm-hmm. I've, I'm pretty sure I've been heavily influenced by Exalted. Yeah, and with now the now um the other. The other thing that the other thing that I, I could that I found vi- that I will always find kind of in, kind of interesting within the within this um, setup is, unlike is the fact that you and en- you ended up boiling down a, vi- a a lot of a lot of a lot of um twists and turns that can happen with ca- with character and class creation into just three vocations which um just calling it vocation is probably going to is probably going to make the um the role the role master fans squeal <laughs> um, <laughs> but you boiled it down to adventure warrior adventurer and adept and one of the things that I was reminded of looking at it even though it's not doing it exactly the same way you are is worm warrior rogue and mage yeah yeah um so when when it came to and of of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the perpetual disappointment that is the Fable series of um, <laughs> video games. Right. <laughs> but um, when it when it came to when it came to the whole idea of doing of doing three vocations, was that something that you nailed that you nailed down early on, or or were there more in earlier drafts that every and everything just got pared down? Yeah, the it, that was always my initial goal. It, it almost flew together. Like we, we just finished talking about the three attacks that in the game: mm-hmm. warfare, influence, and power. And that idea just led right into the idea of okay, uh, warfare, punching, kicking, uh, influence, taunting, befriending, power, spells, and prayers. Hey, why not? Why don't I just have three archetypes that almost perfectly fit into um, those attack stats. And the way that character creation works is if you are a warrior, warfare is cheaper for you to increase. If you are a uh, adventurer, influence is cheaper for you to increase. And of course, if you are an adept, 
uh, power is. So it, it, it has always existed. And I think it probably comes from my uh, champions, uh, mutants and masterminds um, brain where I definitely like to build the character that I want to play. So having an overarching archetype that opens up options for you and you build the type of adventurer you want to play or you build the type of caster you want to play is much more in my wheelhouse than a class-based system where the character is pretty much built for you. Mm -hmm. so yeah, that probably comes from my my supers uh, <laughs> side, of, my supers love of building the character that you uh, you want to play. Which is interesting to me because a big um, pro a big problem that supers games, no matter how simple they end up making themselves, and I've I've jo I've joked that a um, a rules light supers game is an oxymoron. <laughs> um, <laughs> is the is the fact that there is always going to be an inevitable um, inevitable bit of choice paralysis or swim, damn it, within mm -hmm. um, within that kind of setup, simply because of the fact that there, that um. You either have an awkward approach to classes and archetypes, or you just go, or you have to go full freeform simply because of the wide, wide ass net that um su that a supers game has to accompany. Yeah. yeah. And give, given the fact, and given the fact that you've narrowed that down to th to um to three ar to three archetypes, um, was there was there still an effort to make sure that even within individual archetypes that you that um you could have two people being say a warrior and not have the same play style absolutely yeah it was very important to me and just just like what you said uh, analysis paralysis um for instance if you are a warrior one of your starting talents generally characters start with uh four talents at first level um you have to one of the talents that you choose has to be your fighting style. So, for instance, under Warrior, you have uh, two melee weapon fighting style, ranged weapon, hand-to-hand, uh, -hand, um, uh, two-handed weapon fighting style, shield and melee weapon. So that helps um, a player avoid analysis paralysis because one of your talents is going to dictate your fighting style, and then that's going to open up what talents you have available to you and and of course you know a hand-to-hand -hand warrior fights differently than a thrown weapon warrior who fights differently from a um two-handed melee weapon uh warrior and that 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 was um very purposeful so that the game will will gently guide you uh because when you know, as you know, I don't have to tell you, when you give uh, players all the options in the world, you have given them no options. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I know, I know, I know for, for me, the, for me, I've always, I've always been an advocate of what, of what I like to call crunch medium. Um, you know, yeah. having a, having a midway between, between more strict, between more stringent designs and, so, and some sort of package setup that can be that can be used so that people aren't overwhelmed. Um, yep. Now, when it came now, um, one other one other thing that that I'm a that I'm a bit cur I'm a bit curious about is how is um when it comes to when it comes to ra when it comes to um race, um, because what because when you look at a when you look at a lot of fantasy games. Um, mechanically speaking, race doesn't really matter as much as you get into high levels. Like you look at how it works in almost every D and D, except for the one that everybody hates, but me. <laughs> um, race doesn't re one race only seems to matter when over the first three levels. Yeah. After after that, it only mat only matters if you take a paragon class, which nobody wants to take because that involves doing multi classing, which is its own bundle of sticks so yeah <laughs> what is it would it be fair to would it be fair to say that um that because of because of things like racial abilities with um with the races that 
your choice of race is going to matter no matter what level you are? Oh, absolutely. So Peace only has uh, 10 levels. Mm -hmm. uh, but your choice of character, race, or heritage or um, is is important throughout your entire career because essentially your um, your even number levels, you get to pick uh, a talent based on your vocation. And then on odd number levels, you get to pick up a, um, a racial ability based on your race. So your choice of race will, will mold your character throughout their entire career from first level to 10th level. Because like you said, it, it, it is, um, very weird to me that your choice, uh, well, who, who you are or your background or your heritage, um, doesn't inform more about your character than generally, uh, you see in a lot of fantasy games. And I think that, um, of course, I, I, well, not of course, but I have been working on peace for uh, 16 years off and on. But um, so I definitely formulated some of these concepts on my own. But I think like Pathfinder 2nd Edition has also decided to make um, a character, a player character's uh, heritage or race matter at a lot of different levels throughout their career as well. And I think you can choose um heritage based feats i believe beyond first level i could don't don't quote me on that i just think that that's the case but you, um but yeah and, you can <laughs> yeah okay cool yeah oh. um but yeah in peace I, I i consciously consciously wanted to um make sure that your your race mattered um throughout your entire uh career as a hero mm -hmm. now when it comes now, when it comes to when it comes to now, when it came to when it came to um something something like say um drive um one of the th one of the things that's uh, that's that I can always I can always see being um tricky with with something like this is what is the dividing line between a good between a good example of a drive and a bad example and the um benchmark that i use for this kind of thing is an aside that's in the core book for 13th age because 13th age of course has the one unique thing and it goes through a short list of here's a good I here's good ideas for a one unique thing and why here's not as good but you but your gm might be willing to allow it and here's Probably not a good idea to try and do this, and if you do this, your GM is probably going to be um, looking at you sideways, <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah. So when it comes when it comes to when it comes to drive, do you have do you have a, a do you have an aside or a side box about general advice on what would what makes a good drive or a um, not so good drive? Absolutely. So um, the the one thing like we talked about. Um, analysis paralysis mm -hmm. what i do is i give a fairly exhaustive list of drives for the game for characters to pick from so you know it's not you know every possibility in the world choose now new player who has never played a role-playing game so i give a fairly exhaustive list of 12 and i can go over them really quickly so generally players would have these 12 to choose from as far as what drives their character, acquire wealth, become famous, destroy life, which destroy life is not in the in the um, default setting is not an option. But I figured I'd throw it in there in case you wanted to do a twist of maybe having an evil campaign. Uh, but um, preserve nature, resist authority, relish battle, seek thrills, stay alive, protect the innocent, gain power and gain knowledge are the uh and value loyalty mm -hmm. are the suggested drives uh for player characters now and there is a little sidebar that says that um though the list is fairly exhaustive if a player thinks of something that is not on the list allow them to do it and the only things that the game master may want to keep in mind is to just make sure that the drive travels well with the hero for instance i had a player ask me one time is well um none of the drives appeal to me could i do something like 
loyal to family or family matters or uh, protect my family member. Mm -hmm. And I said, you could, but the one thing you have to, you know, understand is you are an adventurer. You're a hero in this world. You're going out to save this world. Do you have a family member with you or are you leaving them behind? Uh, because um, what Drive does is whenever a player character approaches a situation um, in accordance with their drive, especially when it makes their life a little harder, the GM should throw them um, rewards, uh, experience points for good role playing. So if you're never around a family member, you know, how will that particular drive uh, serve you? Mm -hmm. um, so that really is the, the you have those 12 and then you have that bit of guidance that if your player thinks of something else, that's fine. But just make sure that it that drive will travel well with the hero. All right. Now, when it now, um, one there is one getting getting back to vocations for a bit. There is one particular elephant in the room that um, I do that I do want to address, especially since the more popular class based entries always struggle with this with this kind of thing. Let's talk about multi-classing. <laughs> um, far, too, far, too, far too often I have seen cases where multi-classing ends up being pay extra to not suck. Or <laughs> at, or, what, or um, some of the worst examples being all the drawbacks of both and the benefits of neither. Right. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> and of, co of, co of course, um, a lot, a lot of times, when, a lot of times, um, people who end up multi-classing end up do end up trying to dip into one specific thing, and the and that's re and that's really it. But they've got to go through a whole bunch of work just to get that one thing. So, char so character advancement isn't as free form as it sh as it arguably should be in those cases. So, when it comes to peace. How do you approach multi-classing? Well, as you so uh, eloquently laid out, uh, Mildra, because multi-classing is so difficult and winds up leaving players unsatisfied no matter what you do, I decided to completely ignore multi-classing. <laughs> it's it's going to make some people... Some other people unhappy, no. But um, the, my, my um, non-cheeky answer is... Um, because of the mechanical, uh, trinity, as you mentioned, of, uh, the vocations of warrior, adept, and adventurer, it really would be hard to do multi-classing, especially in a system that is an archetype-based system. Mm -hmm. So the closest thing to multi-classing that Peace has is the adventurer. The adventurer vocation is where you will find characters that do a little bit of magic and a little bit of combat. So the adventurer is if, if you wanted to play a cleric who is, you know, can do melee, can do uh, warfare and do a little bit of magic, that the adventurer is where you would find it. Or if you wanted to play a rogue who did a little bit of magic or a ranger who did a little bit of magic, the adventurer would be is the class that you would uh i'm sorry i'm sorry the vocation mm -hmm. or archetype that you would use so i i guess the answer is i chose one vocation to be the semi multi-class uh vocation to be versatile and to allow current players to do a little bit of dabbling in both without having the severe penalties mm -hmm. i guess and yeah to be fair that's not too far removed from the from the from the way um the way kevin crawford d does does the j does the jack of all trades or the gishy char character archetype in um his without number games ah. so you're in good company <laughs> um <clears throat> now give now given given all given all of that it's it, it it there is one there is one there is one aspect that um I do that I do think 
is going to be one of those large elephants, and that is the magic question. And this was one of those things that you that you wanted to de- that you want to deep dive into when we were setting this kind of thing up, because you've you've likely suffered through the quadratic wizards just as much as I have, and you've had to put up with people's bullshit arguments as to why as to why quadratic wizards are not a problem and actually a feature. <laughs> So that br- that brings me to the magic system that you have. Mm-hmm. So the first question that I have on that is obviously obviously how how it's going to work and the second is how do you make sure that magic does not fall into familiar traps and outshine the other pillars? Yes, great question. So I think that um Magic being one of the attack stats in the game, what Peace does something uh, quite well, I think, is that it has a natural balancing um, feature, and it has it is the way that it is set up. The way that you attack and defend in Peace is you attack in three ways, warfare, influence, and power. We've discussed that, but you also defend in three ways. And it is impossible for a character to be good at attacking and defending in all ways. So I think the thing that prevents one character class... Ah, I keep saying character class. Ah, it's... our hobby has... <laughs> that, that prevents one vocation mm-hmm. from outshining the others is that generally... If you are a spellcaster, if a warrior is attacking you, because of the way the game works, generally they're going to get more attacks against you. Because as a spellcaster, you're really good at attacking with spells and defending against spells, but may not be quite as good at defending against uh, mundane implements of warfare, uh, you know, sword or crossbow. Mm -hmm. So... It has a natural balancing effect. And as a GM tip for the game, you know, if you have um, your tank character who your your sword and board character who can't be uh, harmed by melee attacks because they've just built their character to be a just a monster in, in melee, throw a adventurer with really good charisma or influence against them. Mm-hmm. And that, that adventurer is going to, uh, you know, maybe be able to taunt them, uh, make them go berserk and enraged and become very ineffectual in combat. Or if you have uh, a magic user, throw a, a warrior against them. So I think that throughout the entire um, level progression of the game, that remains true and that's something that made me that that was the one of the other things that made me go with the mechanical trinity is that it's it's natural balancing feature where character no character can be good at attacking and defending in the three ways that you can attack and defend in the game mm-hmm. nah. And if I'm, if I'm not mis- if I'm not mistaken, even um, even spell list is ju- is just counted as another form of vocation talents. Yes, absolutely. And though I try to keep the uh, warfare talents um, realistic and believable, um, to to look as little like magic as possible. Um, there obviously are things that warriors can do that a person would never be able to do in the real world. But I hope that I have flavored it such and made it and built it mechanically, designed it mechanically, so that warfare talents don't feel like magic, though you know that couldn't happen uh, in the real world. And, um, of course, magic hopefully uh, feels uh, magical. Mm-hmm. Now, I do want to touch on something regarding gear, which is one of those things that a lot of people would would think that it would think that it's not something to cover all that often. But mm-hmm. it, but um, given 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 the trappings of fantasy gaming, I do think this is wor- this is worthy of discussion. Um, 
more often than not, the aside from aside from the fact that uh, that um gear doesn't se doesn't seem to mat matter as much as you as you develop further on, unless you're dealing with magic items, which we'll probably get to later. But for fighters, the mo the most common approach the most common approach when it comes to equipping them is a large shield and a long sword. Good old sword and board. <laughs> Most, re yeah. most reliable means of attack and defense. It's also really, really, really fucking boring. <laughs> so, when it comes to the choice of when it comes to the choice of weapon, um, is it is it relatively viable to spice that kind of thing up? If somebody wants to be, if someone wants to go full lance necked and and bring and bring a great sword to the fray, for instance. <laughs> Absolutely. As we uh, talked about earlier, um, the game gives players some guidance on their warriors by forcing them to uh, choose a, a fighting style, basically. Mm -hmm. And so, and all of those fighting styles are very different. As if you are a hand-to-hand -hand warrior, as you're probably familiar with some with some games, you're very uh, mobile. Um, you're very quick. Uh, you can be very survivable by not being um, weighed down by heavy armor. Mm -hmm. And if you are a, uh, say, sword and board, as I mentioned, or as you mentioned, you are very good at uh, repelling um, warfare attacks, mm -hmm. mostly, mostly melee. Mm -hmm. So, though gear... We weapons don't have, for instance, their own mechanics that speak to uh, what the weapon is. Your fighting style does. And a warrior who is a two-handed melee weapon warrior is going to feel and play completely differently. So though a um, two-handed sword doesn't is not really mechanically unique other than of course it does more damage than a smaller weapon when you use that weapon the talents dictate that you're going to play and approach conflicts differently and you're going to feel different mm -hmm. now, and that's going to be yep now there's um there's been a bit of a stereotype that for people who want to do the fencer the more Errol Flynn or Zor or Zorro t type of um, character that they'd have that they'd have to fall into the adventurer um, archetype in your case is the is it would it be as vi would it be as viable for someone to um, do a fencer style of build as a warrior or would they be more likely doing adventurer? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, the warrior has a fighting style or uh, um, combat training. Uh, called single melee weapon and the way that the single melee weapon warrior is built is you know they do a lot of par parrying and turning your um your attacks uh against you and uh uh moving out of the way and poking you with crippling blows mm -hmm. so you definitely can build a duelist um through the warrior vocation but mm -hmm. you also can build a duelist in the in the adventurer vocation so um what is the what what would the mechanical difference definitely i would say that the warrior duelist has more combat oriented um talents almost all combat oriented mechanics and doesn't really have access to influence talents but if you build your adventurer through the, uh, you, I'm sorry, if you build your duelist through the adventurer vocation, not only will you have some combat talents, but you will also have access to influence talents. So if you want it to be the duelist who also has a bunch of flair and wanted that to be supported um, by purchasing talents, you may want to, um, you may want to go adventurer but if you wanted to have a duelist who was maybe slightly more hardy, uh, but maybe not as charismatic, you would go through warrior for that. Mm -hmm. But yes, both, both are options. Yep. Which which is good is good because um, there's been plenty when um 
when the when the Banderas Zoro movie came came about, I did have some of my players asking if they could do that as a fighter, and I'm I'm like, yeah, you could you could, but we're but I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to do some house ruling. Um, <laughs> of course, the, of course, then wait, why am I house ruling? I have Tome of Battle. <laughs> There's there's setups in there for specifically for, specifically for fencing weapons. Problem solved. Um, <laughs> I mean, I ended up house ruling anyways, but still. Um. Now when it now um, when it comes to mat when it comes to things like magic items, um, mm -hmm. that's been one of those things that in say early editions of D of D and D was used as a crutch in order to be the main way to make fighters and paladins be interesting. Nah, um, yeah. and it's it's one of it's one of those things that um, in some in some games ends up le ends up leading into the Monty Hall problem. Mm -hmm. So how do how does ma how do magic items um work work similarly and differently to uh, to other games in um peace? Yeah, the one of, one of my favorite, uh, I think, maybe unique aspects of peace are the magic the magic item rules, and uh, the math in peace is such that um, they are not required. Uh, some some games will force you to give magic items in order to keep up with the the level requirements, or you know, s some of the uh, keep your damage output up. But in peace, mm -hmm. that is uh, not an issue. Uh, but peace also has a kind of a the narrative way that magic items work also act as a um, natural balancing system so that the game master doesn't have to always sweat if a magic item is going to unbalance the game. So essentially the way magic items work is a magic user um, constructs a magic item by locking a spell to an exquisitely constructed item mm -hmm. or... Uh, just an item being involved in um, a very important event can turn a um, an item into a legendary magical item. For instance, this uh, a well made sword that a king uses to f to fell a dragon um, could become a magic item just f uh, for being involved in such um, an important event. Mm -hmm. And the way magic items works are all of them, uh, or most of them, have what's called a warping rating. Because a magic item is constantly drawing uh, mana to it and essentially doing the work of casting a spell, and that is how um, a magic item bestows its user with its magical effects. And being bombarded by the reality-altering effects of mana can take a toll on the physical form mm -hmm. so when you have magic items you always have to compare the warping the total warping rating of all the magic items you're carrying to the uh character's ability to defend against magic it's basically their revis resistance defense mm -hmm. and if the warping rating of the items they're carrying uh, exceeds their resistance defense you make a roll on the chart, <coughs> excuse me, and bad things could happen. So that's a natural balancing uh, effect so that the game master doesn't have to worry that magic items are going to unbalance the game. And also a really, a really great narrative reason for why magic items uh, act the way that they do. And um, I, I really love um, that mechanic. There, there are some ways to reduce the warping rating of magic items, for instance, um, runes that can be added to them that reduce um, their warping rating a little bit, or uh, if you wanted to carry the item around safely, um, there are magic, there are bags uh, or chests that can uh, protect you from uh, the warping rating when you know when you just you're just carrying it around so it can be safe. Mm -hmm. But um, but yeah. Now. I've I had noticed that the ma that the um, magic items have five tiers, which which I'm going to call them. Um, that being utility, heroic, elite, epic, and legendary. Um, yes. Which I'm, I'm pretty sure some of these might get might give nightmare flashbacks to pe to people who have had to suffer through any looter shooter in the last five years. But 
I'd like I'd like to pick your brain as to what as to what the threshold is between each of these tiers. So sure. So we'll start we'll start mm-hmm. with the we'll start with the lowest and move up to the highest. So utility first. Yeah, so utility are uh, little trinkets that aren't overpowering. Um they're the I think the the the, the player is going to be happy to have them like a ring of swimming. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. Um, and things like that, or exploding daggers, but they're not going to unbalance the game. They have a low warping rating, and their effects are so incidental and definitely more on the level of a talent um, that they're really safe. So you can, if you want to reward your players with, in in some cases, one-time effects or just useful um, effects, utility magic items are where... Uh, where you can look. Mm-hmm. Okay, next would be heroic. So heroic is obviously um, the next step up. They get a little bit better than the um, than the utility items. They are powerful and rare, um, and that's when you get some things that may act better than uh a character's talent so you have to keep an eye on um on how you dole out these uh heroic items and of course uh because they are more powerful their warping rating um becomes a uh becomes a way to assist you in the game not uh, in the game not be, being uh, unbalanced mm-hmm. um elite so the elite items are really when you start getting into the really powerful and rare magic items in the system. Again, you have that balancing factor of the uh, warping rating. Um, they are really dangerous, but for the most part, citizens don't have to worry about coming across a elite magic item. Uh, generally, you're only going to find those in the largest cities and in the collection of um, individuals who have who have gone out and found these items. Mm-hmm. And lastly, legendary. Yeah, legend legendary, these are the the items that shape the setting. That you know kings have uh, taken over cities uh, with these uh, magic items, you're 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 only going to find these items on a quest, and may- maybe the quest was find this item. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they are extremely powerful, world uh, shaping items, and it's it's definitely going to you're going to have to be a high level hero, um, maybe seven seven to tenth level to even have the stats to safely be able to use such a legendary item and and thank god they're incredibly rare incredibly hard to find because they can be uh, very dangerous in the wrong hands mm-hmm. um now given that i'd like to put it in context i'd like to put this kind of thing in context with a bit of a lightning round of sorts i'm okay. going to i'm going to give i'm going to give you a few examples of art of artifacts and the like through throughout throughout mythology and and pop culture and i'd like I'd like you to tell me what um, tier on your system these th- these things would fall under. So, sure. Uh, since since they're given the given that we're talking about heroic fantasy, I'll start with something simple, and that is Sting. Obviously, not the singer or the wrestler, but the short sword from <laughs> The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. I feel I have to make that clear. Yeah, yeah. I would probably say utility. It was. It had a very, um, a very simple effect. You know, uh, something that was useful but wasn't overpowering. Mm-hmm. I can't imagine, you know, someone um, searching down and try trying to assassinate the character to get uh, Sting from them. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I would. I would say Sting would probably fall under ut- uh, uh, utility, useful but not overpowering. All right. Um, 
next, and I'm I'm pretty sure I'm um, because of the fact that I'm de- that I'm dealing with I'm dealing with Irish words. I know I'm gonna screw up pronunciation. Um, gay bolg. The the spe- the famous spear of Kukulan. Ooh, um, mm. I don't know that I'm familiar with that. Um, the main the main thing about the main thing about the spear is that the mm-hmm. wounds that it inflicted are are not are e- are either difficult or impossible to recover from. Ah, um. and. If it and if it um, if you ended up taking the spear to the heart, you were dead. <laughs> no, uh-huh. no bones about no bones about it. So I would have to say epic. Um, so you have utility, heroic, elite, and epic. Um, it doesn't sound like it would be a legendary item, but it's a very difficult and dangerous item. Mm-hmm. So I definitely would say it would be one step down from legendary. So an epic item. Mm-hmm. All right, um, I'd um to go with something a little bit more, a little bit um mundane. Let's go with the at with the Atlantean sword from the first Conan movie. Mm, the Atlantean sword from the first Conan movie. The main thing about the main thing about it is it is a. It was a it was a sword that was found in a temple dedicated to Krom. Um, it is it is a far more pure kind of steel compared to a lot of the metals that were that were used throughout the story, and has etched on it "Suffer no guilt, ye who wield this in the name of Krom." And of of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that Krom is um, for those for those unaware when it comes to Conan's mythos, Krom is is. Like a pr- like a prototypical version of Odin, in th- especially ah. in the sense that nobody pr- nobody prays to him. In fact, his name is used like an expletive. <laughs> I would have to say because of its <coughs> excuse me its association, even though it may not the its effects may not reach this level, but I would I would probably say legendary. Mm-hmm. It pro what I would probably do is have it be a legendary item, but give it a lower warping rating than uh, than most legendary items. Mm-hmm. Uh, the last the last one that I'm go- that I'm going to reference is al- is also from Irish myth, and that is Khaled Bulg. And what the what effects does that? Do you know the effects? Um, Khaled, Khaled, Khaled Bolg, um, is, it's, it technically translates to, to hard, to hard cleft, um, but it, but it could all, but, um, there, but it has, it has other, it has other associations. Again, again, the thing, the, when de- when dealing with when dealing with um, mythologies from cultures that didn't ex- that didn't exactly have a standardized written wor- written word, things get complicated. Yeah. But the so- but the um the sword it the sword itself um is sa- is said that is said that it. It made a circle like an arc of a rainbow when swung, and could slice off the tops of hills. Uh, legendary. One hundred percent legendary. Mm-hmm. Oh. Absolutely. All right, I, I could, I could def, I could definitely see that. And the reason, the reason why a lot in a lot of these instances I'm focusing on weapons is because, well, in a lot of mythos, that's what that's <laughs> what the legendary item was some ki- some kind of weapon. Um, whether it be whether it be whether it be so, whether it be sword armor or, so, or something else. Um, yeah. Although, if I have to go with if I have to go with an armor example in this kind of thing, um, would shard pl- would shard plate from say the Stormlight Archive count as epic or um, legendary? 
I would say epic. Because it because it's glorified power armor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's power armor that ha that has certain weaknesses, like it like getting hit repeatedly in the same spot. But <laughs> that but yeah, I could def I could definitely see that. Um, now, one idea that I ran by you when we were when we were setting this kind of thing up is is doing is doing a bit of a a bit of a a bit of a, a bit of a building um, walkthrough. Yeah. Um, and for, but in, instead of instead of going step by step because that would that would take quite a bit and and, and since nobody's going to be able to see my screen it wouldn't be as interesting. Mm -hmm. I'd like to I'd like to go with a few um, with a few art with a few archetypes and you and you tell and you tell me how you'd probably build those re regarding the uh, combination of t of ta of talents and vocations. So sure. An obvious one that'll an obvious one that'll start with is the is the is a is a polearm specialist somebody who somebody who uses a spear as a as a total weapon instead of as a keep away. I would probably uh, build a polearm specialist as a single uh, melee weapon. Uh, warrior, mm -hmm. and the reason I would do that is because um, I would imagine you know the pole arm being used for uh, tripping, blocking, uh, maintaining range, mm -hmm. uh, manipulating the uh, target's weapon, and taking advantage of reach. Uh, of course, you don't have to have if it's a spear, you don't have to be a a, a thrown weapon uh, warrior to throw. Uh, it effectively it just means you may not have uh, talents to take advantage of um, uh, getting additional damage or knocking other individuals' weapons out of the air uh, with your spear. But if you're a yeah, pole arm, I would say that it would be a uh, single melee weapon fighter, especially if you know you wanted to fight with those um, advantages of of reach and being able to uh, manipulate your foe. Now, if some now if someone wanted to, if if someone came into this kind of thing and let's let's say let's say for let's say for the sake of it they happen to be a fan of um, firebending from Avatar, um, mm -hmm. how would you how would you how would you work with that? I would um, tell them to be an adept, of course. Um, a um, a cipher mancer is what. Um, uh, arcane casters are called uh, in the setting because of the way that they cast uh, spells, and I would have them um, take the elementalist training at second level. At first level, you're considered an apprentice. You learn the basics of uh, spell casting, and at second level, mm -hmm. you choose from one of the arcane arts, which is uh, el elementalism, illusionism, uh, il illusionists. Mm -hmm. um, um, elementalism, illusionist, necromancy, and um, so I would suggest that they go with uh, elementalists. Mm -hmm. Second level. All right. Now, <laughs> if now if some if somebody wanted to to be a, to be the stealthy type who focused more who focused more on um, util utilizing dif utilizing different types of air arrows to get to get around places so nobody knew nobody even knew that they were there a la um garrett from the good thief games i.e every game except the reboot <laughs> um how would they go about that kind of setup i probably would build it as an adventurer um which would um heavily of course um you you don't have to your uh your vocation you, you can, for instance, be a warrior that can be good at sneaking. Mm -hmm. uh, so the uh, your attributes or what, what um, the game calls attributes are a kind of a mixture of what some games call skills and what some games definitely call attributes. So they are disconnected. So you can build your character to be a very sneaky um, character. 
And I would go with Adventurer because there are talents that can make you even uh, more sneaky and you can be just as um, effective with a bow as a warrior. It's just that a ranged weapon warrior would have more tricks being able to do damage, not mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, thrown or ranged weapons out of the air uh, with trick shots and so forth. But I, I would build it as a an adventurer who was a very a very sneaky rogue who used a bow. Yeah. Now, if some now given given that one of the one of the more po one of the more popular um one of the more popular build setups for say um, barbarians, especially in especially in a game like say Diablo, is the is going full double axes, which bring which brings me to how someone if someone wanted to do a do a dual wielding melee build um mm -hmm. how easy or difficult would it be for them to do that since obviously back in the third edition days dual wielding was pay to not suck <laughs> <laughs> so super super easy uh, a warrior and a two melee weapon warrior training uh so two melee weapon training um, it's actually a uh, a combat style that you you purchase as part of one of your talents as a warrior, mm -hmm. and the two melee weapon warrior is designed to make multiple attacks to deal additional damage to be able to block an attack, uh, because they are wielding uh, two weapons. Uh, it would be the uh, simplest thing in the world to build. As a matter of fact, I built an orc warrior who used two melee weapons and he fought with uh, two hammers mm -hmm. and um he was built in such a way that he had two defensive abilities uh one that canceled damage and allowed him to inflict damage on the attacker and one that allowed the um the uh him to uh, can't to force his attacker to re-roll and a successful attack and basically the way I built my orc is that he always had enough attack points after his turn to do both of those defensive talents. Mm -hmm. So he was he was just he was just a nightmare and I love that orc. Um Grog the uh, the Hammerstorm is what his name was. And he yeah, with two two melee weapon uh warrior uh fought with two hammers and I, I loved him. Mm-hmm. Well, speaking of that, I'd like I'd like to shift over into more unorthodox weapon types and how you might um, adapt adapt these approaches. Um, especially si especially since in su in um, as I've mentioned the as I mentioned in the past that when it whenever um, whenever people do the whole you can do this to do any kind of fantasy and then I bring up well if I want if I want to do if I want to do samurai fantasy how am I going to do that with um, with D with D and D and that some the smart people bring up oriental adventures which has its issues the dumb people <laughs> will say we'll just we'll just ha we'll just house rule a bastard sword as a katana which i'm which i say no <laughs> um, <laughs> like how how am i the most popular build in, in D D involves using a shield how am i going to do that in a, it when you're deal when you're dealing with a country where shield where shield is shield use is not really a thing um <laughs> But I'd I but one particular weapon setup that I'd like to pick your brain that's a classic staple in in, in so in so many stories that involve ninjas is the Kusari Gama. You know, scythe on one scythe on one end of a chain, weight and a weight on the other end. Well, it's it just <laughs> it so happens I I made a cleric. Uh, in the setting, who was a uh, cleric of justice mm -hmm. who fought with um, such a weapon. Now, I hate to tell you that the weapon does not is not actually in the equipment list, but it would be super easy to build. I would build it as uh, probably having um, short sword damage, and I would give it I would give it reach mm -hmm. and. Um, so it, you could attack two um, squares away instead of just uh, to the adjacent square uh, as normal. So to in, in full disclosure, <laughs> I would have to construct the weapon, but it would be the easiest thing in the world. Like I said, uh, one one reach um, and maybe give it short sword um, damage and 
I would probably allow, because of how the weapon is used, I would probably use the um, either the two melee weapon uh, talents, which does a lot of um, which does a lot of blocking and um, striking back, or even a single melee weapon uh, training which does a lot of um, enemy manipulation trips and so forth. And I think both of those would fit, could be flavored to, um, to fit the weapon. Mm -hmm. And I will note that I'm aware that, th that this kind of weapon is not in the list. The main reason yeah. that it asks on this kind of thing is to, de is to demonstrate the hackability of what's available. Um, ah. So... Taking with that with that in mind, another another weapon that I'd like to I'd like to ask about is um, a meteor hammer. Um, if you've seen if you've seen if you've seen Kill Bill Volume One, that was the that was the ball and chain that Gogo -Go Yubari was using. Ah. Um, it is a, it is technically a flail, but there's a whole lot more chain and a whole lot less handle. Uh huh. In fact, there's no handle. It's just a, it's a literal ball. It's a literal ball and light and light chain. Ball and chain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the old ball and chain. Yeah. I would I would probably build it the same way because actually because it has a uh, heavy ball on the end. I may give it mace damage and give it uh, give it reach. And as I as I mentioned earlier, well. Um, I, I actually, it sounds like I'm going against what I said earlier when I said that um, weapons really don't have their own characteristics or own abilities, but there there are a couple, like reach is one of them mm -hmm. um, be, because you, you have to, you know, uh, some weapons, some really long weapons uh, should have that benefit. So that is one of the only really um, weapon-based characteristics and everything else that you would do is I would grant the player character, as I said, a um, warrior uh, training talent that fit the weapon, mm -hmm. and uh, let them go. Let them go from there. But I, yeah, I would I would change it to uh, probably uh, mace damage because of the the heavy head. Yeah. Um. Another a another one that another one that I would be I would be curious about because it's it's kind of an un, it's kind of an unusual um, setup. Is a S talk, and the S talk is, um, it is it is a two it it is a it is a two hand it is a two handed sword that has a mm -hmm. that has a lot more emphasis on um on th on thrust maneuvers. It's a lot more pointed than than say a long sword is. Which is still pointed, mm -hmm. but not nearly not nearly as pointed as an S talk is. Hmm. Well, I would definitely um, allow it to be used two handed, mm -hmm. um, and I would say that prob probably um, the long sword in the game would be able to fit that characteristic. And if the if the player if the play you know it would it would have the ability to be used. Um, I don't know if the realistically if it could be used one handed, uh, but if it if it could, there the game also has um, restrictions on how many hands you could use because of course, as I said, with the different warrior builds, mm -hmm. weapons are listed under single single hand, two hand, thrown, ranged. So it would fall under whatever the appropriate uh, number of hands would be, and that also, of course, would dictate uh, which warrior talents um, you could you you would make sense for the weapon. Mm -hmm. But it seems it seems fairly fa fairly easy to uh, to emulate. Yeah, and I, I can I can definitely see see that see that kind of setup. Um, now with the, with all with all of that in with all of that in mind, um, I do I do want to wish you the be the best of luck when it comes to the when it comes to the upcoming Kickstarter. Your um, 
It's only been it's only been up for a day, and it's and at the time of this recording, you're just under a thousand, so you're just under one fifth of the way there. Yeah. Um, and you and you've got you got forty four you got forty four days left. Um, now, yep. knock on wood for this next question. But <laughs> presuming ever presuming everything goes as planned, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? So a release window where um, I wanted to give myself enough time because what the what the um, Kickstarter is doing is I'm trying to um, compensate the artists and uh, the editors for the little bit of editing that has to be done. The game has been written and uh, is in the high 90 percentile uh, as far as layout and all it has to it has to be illustrated and um, uh, another editing pass. Hmm. And just to give you an idea, um, if we fully fund, the, this, the game is going to have somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 um, NPCs that have to be illustrated. So you figure, you know, uh, an illustration may take an artist a week or two um, with just the bestiary having 80 um creatures that must be illustrated you know you can you can figure that, that it's going to take a while so um and then with all of the you know the things you run into with delays and so forth october of um 2022 is what we're shooting for so um a little bit over a month and that's be just because of the sheer massive number of illustrations uh, that have to be uh, done for the game. And of course, if we have or if I have a run of luck and no one ever misses a um, a deadline and I am able to um, have a really solid uh, number of illustrators, when it's done, we're going to release it. So if it's done a month early mm -hmm. or two months early, we're going to release it because literally all I am doing is um, illustrating the book and doing another editing pass because the game has been completely writ written after 16 years. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and I'll, I'll certainly be looking forward to seeing the fruits of, si of 16 years of, of, um, of, of what is was essentially bashing our heads against the wall until, so until something falls out. <laughs> Right, right, right. And I want to thank you uh, so much, Mildred, for what you've been uh, super supportive. Um, I see the sheer number of independent um, guys who come on, or well, well established guys who you ha you have talked to, and you treat everyone uh, like we are. We are the big guys uh, in the industry, and I can't tell you how important that is to a, a small indie guy like me mm -hmm. uh, because the you know, the only way the hobby is is going to grow and we're going to give people those new experiences which is a tagline for peace a uh, new mm -hmm. setting new system new experiences mm -hmm. is for guys like you who are doing the gaming gods work and um i would uh thank you i want to thank you again my my, for your pl my pleasure is my pleasure as always and anytime you see fit to come to come back to the temple whether it's to Further deep dive into peace, whether it's to do, whether it's to do hacking experiments, or or just a shit post about the bard dying for the fiftieth time. <laughs> the, <laughs> the door the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> and, thanks a lot, and please, yeah. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>